We all want that like pristine, like freshly mowed, full green grass. But every once in a while, we end up getting dandelions on our lawn. With therapy, we can learn different tools to pick those dandelions. But the thing is, is when those stressors or triggers come back, those dandelions are going to keep coming back. So with EMDR, what we're really doing is we're looking to find those roots so that we can get the full root out so we don't have to keep picking those dandelions. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I'm your host, Todd Rennebaum. Thank you for joining me for another week. Uh, it's another great episode. Uh, this episode, I'm speaking with Brianna Taylor. and She's a therapist and a social worker. Uh, she's a master social worker and registered social worker. And she specializes with uh, EMDR therapy, uh, especially for youth. That's, that's where she wants to focus her passion. Uh, And for those of you that don't know what EMDR stands for, it's Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And it has become a very popular type of therapy over the last five to ten years. It's it's all the rage, and I know nothing about it, so I thought that would make a great episode just talking to someone about that. Uh, Next week, I'm going to be speaking with Elise Michaels, and she is a men's mental health coach. She's extremely popular. Uh, and she's pretty smart. Uh, it was a really great conversation. Uh, I know I've kind of covered men's mental health a few times in the past, uh, and and I really wanted to talk with a female about it. Uh, so it it's a nice, interesting uh, perspective and look at men's mental health. Uh, and that's next week. Thank you for everybody that have sent messages and comments and shared and liked all the my social media stuff over the last uh, week or so. Uh, This is episode 101, so it was a nice little celebration of 100 episodes over the last week. So, uh, yeah, thank you for all the comments and and, uh, shout-outs. If you want to follow me on Instagram, you can follow me at Bunny Hugs Podcast. And on TikTok's Bunny Hugs Podcast. And on Facebook, it's Bunny Hugs Mental Health. And please rate and review the podcast, especially on Apple Podcasts. Uh, and whatever other apps you're, you're listening to this on. Uh, I'm very excited. I got lots of really great guests lined up and already recorded. And it's it's I'm not running out of uh, interviews or, or subject matter when it comes to mental health. So, uh, yeah, keep, keep listening. Keep coming back. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, uh, I give you Brianna Taylor. And so I had first heard about EMDR when I was in grad school and same sort of thing. I remember hearing something about eye movements while doing therapy. And I was like, this sounds absolutely ridiculous. What the heck? (laughs) And so I was like, I have to try it. So I ended up seeking out my own EMDR therapist to give it a try. Um, And I find just generally in my practice, if I'm going to like invest in a certain, like learning a certain therapy, I want to try it for myself too, because if I don't fully have buy-in, then it's hard for me to like show up really authentically with that type of therapy for my clients. I appreciate that. Yeah. So I've been in talk therapy for most of my adult life. Um, As a client. What's that? As a client or as a, as a client while also being a counselor myself. Um, And so I found my therapist and I was like, I really want to try EMDR. I've heard a little bit about it. It sounds super wacky, but I'm willing to give it a try. He explained the whole process to me and we got started. And I remember it would have been after my third or fourth session. It was the end of the session and we were like closing everything up and I just burst into tears And as a therapist, like, that's the worst thing you want at the end of a session once everything's, like, contained and everything. And I just saw, like, my counselor's face go white. And he's like, "Uh uh-oh, what happened? And I was just like, I'm relieved. And I was like, this is the first thing that I found that has been, like, so effective and has given me, like, this amount of relief in what I'm dealing with. Um, And then from there, I was just like, man, I need to 
I need to learn this. Like I need to add this to my toolbox because this is, this is huge. So is it, it's not like, like sometimes talk therapy. It's like, even if you don't have a problem, you should go and just have a, you know, it's like pre maintenance. It's like, or uh, not pre maintenance. Um, you mean like proactive? Maybe, maybe that's what I mean. So it's like before something bad happens, you already got the tools and whatever. Whereas EMDR, it's not like that. It's more like it's treating trauma or is it just every day you, you should sit down and do some EMDR? And... Yeah. So EMDR um, comes from a theory called adaptive information processing theory. So the easiest way to explain it is through metaphor. So I use the metaphor of like a front lawn. So we picture up us all like a front lawn. We all want that like pristine, like freshly mowed, full green grass. But every once in a while, when certain conditions come up in our life or stressors, we end up getting dandelions on our lawn. Those dandelions can look like things like panic, low self-esteem, addiction, etc, etc. And so with therapy, we can learn different tools to pick those dandelions. But the thing is, is when those stressors or triggers come back, those dandelions are going to keep coming back. So with EMDR and the theory, it's kind of based around what we're really doing is we're looking to find those roots so that we can get the full root out. So we don't have to keep picking those dandelions. So you're, you're correct in that it is working with past trauma memories or memories of like stressful events. That's what we're working with as part of that foundation. So we work in in the past. So processing past memories. Then we work on addressing present triggers or present stressors. And then we work towards a future template. So how would you like to respond to certain stressors or problems in the future? But we have to start back in the past to make sure we can get those roots. Hmm. Interesting. You know, dandelions are good for bees though. I did hear that actually. <laughs> I just, someone told me that last night. So that analogy is. It's I not need good to find a different analogy. Maybe <laughs> those like really pokey weeds that hurt when you walk through a field. Okay. Yeah. Let's go with those. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> They're probably good for something too, but who knows? Anyway, uh, <laughs> for building character. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So I had, I, I shouldn't, I should stop talking about this because every episode I bring it up now, but I've just been recently diagnosed with ADHD, but I've gone through anxiety, depression, um, addictions and stuff. And so the ADHD I feel is the root of the dandelion and the dan, you know, that keeps coming up. So it, it's, it's something like, it's something like that, but you're not diagnosing somebody with something. It's like the root thing is maybe an event or, or a tragic something. Yes, exactly. So it's a it's a memory. Gotcha. So when we experience trauma, our memories aren't stored the same way our typical memories are. So our body is wired to like move towards health in a natural way. So the example I use is if I got a paper cut, I wouldn't have to consciously tell my skin to like bind together and heal. It just does it, right? Um, same thing with when we experience things in our day, just naturally those things are filed away. When we get a sliver, there's something that's kind of blocking that natural process from occurring. So our, although our skin tries to heal, there's something blocking it. So similarly, when we experience trauma or an event that overwhelms our ability to cope, it's kind of like we get a little sliver in our memory networks. Mm. And so instead of being stored as it should be, it's stored in a similar state to as it was experienced. So the past becomes the present. So I use the example of test anxiety loss. So this is something that most people have experienced at some point or another. We can probably for the most part, think back to a test that we were anxious about without re-experiencing the test anxiety. Right. It's not like a super pleasant, fun memory to think back to, but we're not like all of a sudden like noticing our heart starting to race and getting sweaty with trauma or memories that are maladaptively stored. Something might trigger part of that memory and we might start to re-experience 
some of the things that we experienced at the time of that event. So with EMDR, what we're doing is we're targeting those memories or those events that are maladaptively stored and working with them to move towards that health so that they're processed fully. We're not erasing the memories, but we're taking that distress out of them. So some of those memories, when we look back on them, they might not be pleasant, like the test anxiety. Um, we can't like magically change those events into like super happy memories, but we can take that distress and spiciness away. Oh, spiciness. Um, okay. So I, I just, I do remember one other thing I heard that someone told me about EMDR. It's you do kind of have to almost really think about and relive the, maybe not relive, but you know, you have to go through that traumatic event again. And you like, cause most people avoid it, right? They, they don't they're like, I don't want to think about that. It's gross mm -hmm. or it's, it's painful or whatever. Um, but with EMDR, you have to, you have to think about that event and then process everything that's going on with it. So I like the analogy of a sliver here mm -hmm. because <laughs> not only is it stuck, sometimes I get slivers. I don't even know I have it until days later and it starts to irritate and be itchy right. or pokey. And then it's like, oh, and then you have to pull out a needle and you have to poke at it to get it out. Yeah. And that, and that's scary thinking like, oh, I have to, I have to like poke you have myself. To and, it. Yeah. 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 But then once it's out, it's like, oh, the God, oh, that feels so good. As soon as, as soon as it's out, you know, it's out. It's like, oh yeah, there it is. So yeah, that's a good yeah. analogy. Yeah. There was also the analogy. I did a training with Ana Gomez, who's kind of like the guru of using EMDR with kids. And she uses the example of digestion. So when we have, you know, when we eat too much, we get kind of that like yucky, full bloated feeling. And so with EMDR, we're chopping up those pieces of information so that we can keep the stuff that's good for us and going to help us grow and get stronger. And we can get rid of what we don't need. Kids Shit love out. talking about poop. So it's <laughs> like, you know, when you're constipated and you have to poop it out, it's like not a comfortable process, but oh my God, it feels so much better after you're done. Mm -hmm. I too talk about poop a lot, <laughs> Love mostly, <it>. mostly with kids. <laughs> I have friends with young kids are like, uh, we were driving on, on our way here. The kids were asking if you'd be talking about poop again. We said, yeah, probably. And then it's like, yeah. <laughs> because kids poop. like poop. Kids love poop. <laughs> poop comes up so much in my job. <laughs> really? So uh, do you mostly work with, with younger people? Yeah, that's kind of my area of passion and specialization. Um, I work with children, youth, and young adults, but I do see adult, like older adults, if it's trauma specific. So trauma and kids are kind of my, where my passion is. So, so why would kids need EMDR? Like they don't have trauma? Kids like do trauma? have trauma. Okay. Because you said trauma and kids. Oh, I mean, like for older adults, like I, okay. I'll take older adults if it's trauma specific. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Bless you for doing this work. Cause I'm, I imagine you are hearing some awful, awful things. The thing the about EMDR, when we're doing processing work, it's not like where it differs from like trauma focused CBT is it's not like going through a trauma narrative. Um, it's working with the nervous system. So when we go through a set and the kids holding their trauma memory in their mind, I might pause and say, what did you notice? And they might say, oh, I noticed a really yucky feeling in my tummy. And I'll say, okay, just notice that. And then we'll go for another set. What did you mm. notice? I so noticed you're not asking specifics about the trauma, like where did this happen and who did that? And No, no. So what were... I mean, there's certain parts that we need to know to activate the correct memory. But as we're processing, we're really trusting the brain to do the healing work that it's programmed to do. We're just helping it along with that bilateral stimulation um, and the therapy. When did EMDR, actually, you know, we haven't even said what EMDR stands for. Yeah, yet. that's good to know, hey? I something. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. 
But I like how Ana Gomez, again, she works with kids using EMDR. Is she a she pop paint- singer? She's not. Oh, that's Selena Gomez. Selena. <laughs> Different person? Different person. Sorry. Anna's Sorry. still pretty cool, though. Okay. Um, <laughs> She uses Does she a date different... Bieber? Not that I know of. Oh, okay. No. Okay, sorry. I'll stop <laughs> now. Um, she uses the acronym Eyes Move to Digest and Recover, which I like because it's poop. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> who, who, do you know who kind of created it or who's who fine-tuned it and how it became popular? Yeah, so it was... Founded in the 1980s by Francine Shapiro. And the origin story of it is Does she kind date of, Bieber? <laughs> she did not date Bieber, no. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't think anyone in the EMDR world has. Maybe Bieber's mm. had EMDR yeah, therapy. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> he might benefit from it. But... <laughs> right, right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, so French scene Shapiro was walking through a park one day um, and she had just found out some stressful news about her health. And she noticed as she was walking through the park and kind of thinking about this stressful situation, she was naturally just kind of like moving her eyes side to side. She was walking along this park and she noticed her level of distress start to decrease. And she was like, I think I have something here. And so that's kind of like the catalyst of EMDR. Was she already in mental health and counseling and stuff? Or was she yeah, just a random yeah. person that was like... Yeah, no, she was already in mental health. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I still like, it just like amazes me to have that amount of mindfulness to like recognize just shifting your eyes was like lowering your distress. Huh. That is kind of weird. It almost sounds like bullshit. It does. But so from there, (laughs) it sounds super wonky. Like when I first heard about it too, I was like, this can't be real. But from there, um, she started to study it and research it. And so primarily it was um, studied around treatment for PTSD and war veterans. Um, And since then, there's been so much, so much more research and different applications and advanced trainings that have come from it that, um, it's used a lot more widely for a bunch of different mental health presentations. And even for myself now, like I do specialize in trauma, but I do see individuals with like anxiety, depression, issues with self-esteem, um, attachment wounds. Any person I see, I'm setting up like an EMDR client, whether we go fully into the reprocessing work kind of depends on the individual and what their goals are. But just the case conceptualization itself is just so widely applicable to so many different um, mental health presentations. Hmm. So someone comes in who to see you who has chronic anxiety and you, you just say like, look over here, look over there, look over here, look over there, look over here, look over there, look over there. <laughs> come, yeah, back so in a, come back next week. <laughs> a lot of people, like when they come to me, it's starting to get more popular. So people will specifically email me and be like, I'm interested in EMDR. And I'll be like, hey, sweet, come in. And then we're doing our work and they're like, when do I start moving my eyes around? And I'm like, okay. (laughs) It's more than just that. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot more than just that. Um, We work in eight different phases. So we do like a history taking and treatment planning. Um, We do lots of preparation and building resources. Um, From there, we look at the specific target that we want to work with and do an assessment so we can activate it into the working memory. And then we start using the bilateral stimulation, which is the, the eye movements to help desensitize and reprocess the memory. From there, we work at installing new positive beliefs, um, you know, scanning the body to make sure there's no residual information left in there. And then we close our target. So it's a lot more complex and extensive than just sitting with a memory and shifting your eyes around. Hmm. Did you say extensive or expensive? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Do you recommend you have coverage? <laughs> uh, uh, um, bilateral stimulation sounds dirty. 
doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds very sciencey. That's basically uh, just like back sounds and Sounds like forth. a genre. <laughs> like a genre. <laughs> um, never mind. It's, it's back and forth stimuli. So the most um, common is eye movements, and that's the most research. But oh, so there's um, other ways than yeah, with your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So sometimes um, people, for like injuries or whatever reason, the eye movements might be difficult for them. So um, we can do like different like tapping. So sometimes we'll do like a butterfly tap. I was going to ask about tappings. My wife yeah. is a body talk practitioner. Oh, cool. I don't know if you know what that is. I've heard of it. And there's a lot of tapping and stuff. And yeah. Again, it's like I, it sounds like hokey voodoo or something, <laughs> you know, some new age hippie stuff, but I mean, it is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Working with the body is so important. I, I said it sounded like bullshit earlier. I, I was just being, again, I was just being a smart ass because anyone I've ever talked to that has had trauma has talked about EMDR and it working. So, so yeah, you never, you never know. Everyone's different and like who, who are, why are we so arrogant to think that we know exactly how the brain and the body works and, and they're, they're not connected and like the more research people do and the longer we live, it's like the more you find out weird things about the body and why not Reiki? Why not yoga? Why not this yeah. other stuff? So. Yeah, anyway. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, a lot of these things um, like around the body and like somatic work has been around for a really long time in other cultures. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate right. that now they're only kind of gaining merit because of like Western standards of like evidence and research. Um, but these things have been along for a long, long, long time. And so um, it is nice now that, you know, working with the body is starting to get integrated into therapy because, um, yeah, you can talk till you're blue in the face. But if you're not, you know, working holistically on your healing, you're missing stuff. It's like that whole body, mind, spirit, balance, connection thing. Was so, so, yeah, of course, our, our brain is part of our body like what when why of course doing things to your body might help mental health things absolutely like trauma and whatever so it has become more common and do you think it's become more common because it people are finding it works <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> kind of I a think, dumb question i guess but i think that's definitely part of it i i've seen it like more and more in the media too like prince harry had like a special or something where he was doing EMDR. I didn't watch it, but I heard of it. Um, and one of my guilty pleasures is the Real Housewives series. And a couple of the ladies on that series have, Which you know, city? shown um, Beverly Hills, um, Potomac, no, uh, Salt Lake, kind of, and New York. All three of, yeah, it's, it's been brought up, huh? Oh, huh. not in all three. It was in Salt oh. Lake and Beverly Hills. I don't think anyone on New York. Yeah. Um, my wife watches every freaking one of them. <laughs> uh, what's the other one? The the the, uh, the the old British lady with the restaurant. Vanderpump Rules. Oh, yeah. I haven't gotten into that one. Don't. But I have some friends who are very into it. Very invested. Um, it's like watching the most unlikable people on earth. And you sit for an hour watching them just be complete bastards to each other. I don't know what it is about it, but like on a Friday night, the like my favorite thing to do is like have a glass of wine and hang with my girls. That's exactly, <laughs> that is exactly my wife. She, my wife is like the exact opposite of these people. It's like she's like the nicest, kindest, quietest person, and then she watches these animals. <laughs> then maybe that's why she watches. That. I don't know. I don't get. I don't know. We'll have to do some EMDR on her and find out why. <laughs> Try and get to the root of that one. <laughs> yeah, get to the root of why she watches those shows. Anyway, um, have you ever had clients where you're like, okay, this isn't working and like maybe you should try a different m modality or... Yes. Yeah? I definitely have run into... Like it's a very... How do I say it? It's like a protocol you follow. And so sometimes you have people come in and they just like, it's like textbook, like it works so well and it follows the protocol and you're like, this is awesome. 
and other people dig their heels in or well sometimes you go to do processing and you start the bilateral stimulation the back and forth movements or whatever and you'll be like what did you notice and they're like "Mm, nothing and you're like okay go with that what did you notice nothing and you're like just sweating you're like oh my god um and so particularly when I first started and that happened I would just panic and be like I guess this person isn't right for EMDR um but part of the certification process is getting consultation and so after taking some of those cases to my consultant um it's it's a lot more complex with that. And so even though there's eight phases, they don't always happen super linearly. So sometimes when that blocked processing happens, it might mean we need to go back to some preparation and add in some more resources or do some work with defenses or build some affect tolerance. So um, it's not always super straightforward, but I think with the right resources and preparation work in place, um, it can be effective for most people. Hmm. So potentially it could help, like I said, most people, but you also have to be willing and somewhat open-minded and not be like, Meh, I'm doing it. It's not working. Right. Yeah. And I mean, some, sometimes those are just people's natural defenses. Right. And, and they're not even aware that they're having these defenses come up for them because it is like a really unnatural thing to be like, let's focus on this really stressful event when maybe for most of your life, you've had these defenses pushing it away. And so to do the exact opposite of that can be really counterintuitive. And so we have to find ways to acknowledge and honor those defenses because they've done a good job at protecting people from getting as far as they have. But then how do we work with those defenses instead of against them so that we can move forward into that reprocessing work? You sound smart. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, to honestly, I, I did like talk therapy, CB, CBT, I almost said CBD. That's a whole other thing. Um, for like a year or more. And it really wasn't doing anything because I was not doing any of the homework. I was not, I was mm. like, I was, I guess I just wasn't ready to want to do the work to be better mm-hmm. or, or change or whatever. So. In a, in, a, in a way, it was a complete waste of time. <laughs> like, I think so much of effective therapy is the therapeutic relationship, too. Like, that adds so much potency to the work you're doing. So I always have to remind myself that I'm not going to be a good fit for everyone in my personality. And I tell people, I'm like, finding a good therapist is like finding a good hairdresser. You need to, like, shop around and make sure you find somebody who you feel is a good fit for you. Um, and I found one, but I still didn't do the homework. So I, I loved it. Like I, so I, I had a couple, I, I went, I shopped around and uh, I found a guy that I really liked. We got along really well. And um, I still wasn't doing the work. It was just, mm-hmm. I like this guy. I would hang out with, you know, he's the kind of guy I'd go and have a beer with. So I liked him, but I still yeah. didn't do any of the work. So yeah. I wasn't being honest with myself because he wasn't pushing me hard enough and stuff. You know what I mean? It was like, who do I like hanging out with for an hour, but won't also, you know, make me change because I still really liked some of the bad stuff I was doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I, even for myself, <laughs> shouldn't say this, but <laughs> full confession. So when Yay. I went to eat. When I went to EMDR for the first time, there's two particular resources that are a requirement that they're like tools that you learn before you start processing. And so one is called Calm Place that can help you go from like a more like distressed state to a calm state. And then the other one's called the container, which helps you like contain the work so that you don't leave a session like feeling super raw and heavy and icky. So I did the two resources with my therapist and um, he's like, practice them twice a day so that your brain can learn them. And I tell clients this all the time. I'm like, we need to practice these things because if you go to a piano recital and practice your piece for the first time at the recital, it's probably going to bomb. Our brain needs time to learn these things. (laughs) And so 
what do I do? I don't practice my resources. And then we go into processing. And the week after my first processing session, where we were working with some of my trauma, I'm like, oh my God, I'm not doing okay. So I like had to like sneak in like the next week. And I was like, I am just like super like raw and emotional and blah, blah, blah. And my therapist is like, okay, so how did the complex and container go? And I'm like, uh, didn't do it. <laughs> and he's like, you lied to me. It's hard to practice therapy homework, even as a therapist. Absolutely it is. Because, I mean, so, yeah, because now you have to sit at home and think about and do the the achy work that you don't want to do. It's like you have to go at home now and poke the sliver yeah. as well. So, yeah. I, I tell people all the time, like, I do, I haven't for a while, but I, I used to do, I still, do, I will. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I've done a lot of public speaking and stuff about mental health and whatever, my story and whatever. And I tell people all the time, it's like, you, you've got to do the work. Like, no one's going to cure you. Yeah, my example, going to therapy for like a year and a half. And I was like, why isn't it working? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I'm taking medication. I'm seeing a therapist. Why isn't it working? But I'm doing none of the work. I'm doing none of the work. It's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You got to get your hands dirty, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. But the benefits are so worth it. Yes. And then I went to treatment for 28 days. And that was like, I mean, that was boot camp for, it was 24 hours a day of poking slivers. Um, but anyway. Yeah. I, uh, they should do that. I wish. In, sorry. Just, I think you're, just, I think we're about to say the same thing. Yes. In school, like in oh. school. Oh, no, I was going to say, gonna say in treatment centers, they should do EMDR, but anyway. They should do EMDR in treatment centers. Um, yeah. I think some, do well not in I don't know about Saskatchewan but one of my things that I'm really passionate about and I think when I was doing my my clinical placement for my graduate degree my supervisor really wanted me to try working with adults because I had this just like I just want to work with kids and she's like we'll just try working with adults like you can do it blah 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 and for some reason it really freaked me out I was like oh I don't want to work with adults um which is usually the opposite most therapists are like I don't want to work with kids <laughs> adults um, are authority figures I yeah well exactly I had some of my own stuff I was like oh, I don't want to do it <laughs> um but what made me really what really struck me when I worked with adults is sitting down with somebody for the first time and them learning for the first time about how their brain works and how the stress response works and how to ground themselves for the first time in their adult years. And it was just so sad to me because these are things that we should learn like so much earlier on about how our nervous system and our body works and our what is mental health and what is the stress response. These things should be taught so much earlier on. And I shouldn't have to be explaining it for the first time to somebody in adulthood. Were they boomers or not quite that old even? Because I'm sure like, I'm sure my dad to this day probably doesn't understand how. Or oh my yeah. Mom. they were, My first couple adults were boomers. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Because yeah, there's, there's a lot people have learned since then about mental health and stuff. And yeah. Um, yeah. How old are you? Do you mind me asking? 30. Okay. I was going to say, I wonder if people in their thirties understand better. I, I find like, I love working with university students, like around that age, like post-secondary, um, cause they're, they definitely are starting to like talk more and learn more about mental health and, um, or just so, like come with so much insight about their mental health and their environments and how that affects them, um, so I think like maybe a decade down, it's starting to change for sure. Mm, mm, um, mm-hmm. I still don't, I still don't think there's enough in the schools and I'm, I'm hoping there's more soon. One of my like things that I do, I'm probably like blacklisted <laughs> in my free time. Is <laughs> I really like, I'm really passionate about like demystifying counseling because I have so many kids come to me and they're like, I know what the dentist does. I know what the doctor does. I know what the eye doctor does, but I do not know 
what this lady does who's in front of me. Um, and I think every kid should know what a counselor does. And so one of my pastimes is I like email toy companies and ask them to make like a counselor Lego set or like a counselor Barbie, Barbie doll or whatever, just so like kids can get exposed to these things so much more earlier. And it's less of like this like mysterious anomaly and just something that's like another helper in the community that they're aware of. Mm-hmm. I actually wrote an article one time and it got picked up in a couple of newspapers about the same thing, but about like the psych ward and addiction treatment centers and stuff. It's, it's always like this walled off thing. Like what's it in there? Like they, they keep all the weirdos in there. It's like, what, you, you know what a, a other hospital hallways look like and other hospital rooms and stuff. And that one's, that one's locked. And you know, it's like, well, why, why maybe we should, maybe people should see in there because the people that probably need in there most are usually scared of the unknown yeah, and have anxiety. So they don't know what the fuck they're getting into when they're going into the psych ward. But whereas if they're like, Oh, that's what it's like, you know, when then it's, you know, the, the, all the, the only images they have are like from movies and TVs, which are, you know, super dramatized and yeah. exaggerated. Um, yeah. so yeah, I agree. Demystifying every kind of anything to do with mental health and addictions should be a thing. Yeah. And just like correcting the misinformation that creates a lot of stigma. Yeah. I remember going to my first therapist actually, or maybe it was my psychiatrist. Yeah. It was actually the first time I went saw my psychiatrist, I was expecting to lay on the couch and he'd be smoking a pipe and be this <laughs> lots of wood and books around. And it was, it was just like a doctor's office. He comes in and he's like, how are you doing? Okay. You need to here, fill out your prescription and, and hand it to me. I'm like, well, don't we like have a session? He's like, no, no, people think that all the time. No, that's that's what therapists and counselors are for. I'm a psychiatrist. I, I just basically, I'm a, right. I, pres- yeah. I prescribe meds. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'm like, well, in the TVs and stuff, you know, in the movies, the psychiatrist is doing all, he's like, nope, it's all bullshit. Yeah. Like, it was like a five minute session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, a, not even a session, just a five minute, Here, here, here's these meds. I think they'll do you good. And uh, if you need more, come see me. I was like, yeah. Oh. What is the, as far as you know, in Saskatchewan, what's the accessibility to EMDR therapists? Yeah. So it, I would say EMDR is like newer in Saskatchewan. Um, I'm trying to think it was maybe just under two years ago. Um, we started a group for clinicians who are trained in it called Sask EMDR. So we meet up once a month um, and just talk about different tri- advanced trainings people have done or different like different things they've tried, successes, challenges. So it was kind of, yeah, a mismatch in our meetings for the first little bit. But now that we've been around a bit longer, the community is growing of people who are trained in it. Um, and people are starting to specialize more within the group, which is kind of nice to see so that we can refer to each other. And now with um, mental health supports being more common to be virtual since COVID, it, the accessibility has increased. Oh, you can um, do it on, you can do it virtually and it's yeah. just as effective? Yeah, okay. you can do it virtually. Um with kids, I probably wouldn't. I would do it in person with kids, but I would say, yeah, teens, adults, you could have success with it virtually. Um, so there's a community growing like within the trained clinicians to provide referrals, but I definitely think that we have a need for more people to get trained in it as well. Um, my consultant who I see for my EMDR certification is based in Regina and he's actually um, in the process of getting trained to be a trainer. So hopefully if we have someone kind of in province who is a trainer, we can get more and more clinicians trained so that it is more widely accessible across the province. Do you have to be a psychologist or a social work background before you can take EMDR training? Yeah. Or can you just, okay, sorry. Yeah. And that's, That's one of the barriers is there are practitioners, particularly in social work, who who do provide counseling with an undergrad graduate social work degree. Um, But in order to take the training for EMDR, you do need graduate 
training in social work or psychology or um, counseling, because those those courses give you kind of the foundation that you need to understand yeah. some of the concepts of EMDR and how it works. And like if something happens and you're like, you're dealing with trauma. So you're, you've already got a four or five, six year education <laughs> based. Right. So this yeah. is, yeah. Uh, yeah. When you said uh, some people within the EMDR uh, trained community are, are starting to specialize in things. Uh, what, what kind of specialties like? Kind of like around certain presenting issues or populations. So. Um, Only farmers. <laughs> farmers probably could be their own maybe special population with Absolutely. their yeah um well i'll use myself i i am one of t- one of two in the province who has the has trained with ana gomez and um has the training in um a child specialist emdr work what so there's only two of you that do emdr with children in the entire province with I think some people see or like trained be teenagers, but yeah, trained. Yeah. As far as I know too. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. I suppose other people might take younger people. They just don't have the specialized training perhaps. Yeah. Is it different? Yeah. How, how, why, why is it so different from adult to child? There's a lot of differences. Um, we incorporate a lot of play therapy into the work. Working with kids in general, I feel like, is like sneaking vegetables onto the plate or like <laughs> sneaking in a lot of like therapy things into play so that it's fun and engaging. Um, do you like the TV show, The Office? Yes, I do. It's like when Toby's trying to do the session with uh, Michael. Absolutely. And, and they start that's playing ex- cards. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. 100%. Yeah. It's okay. If we think about like EMDR and what we're asking the client to do is essentially to sit, you know, to poke the sliver, to sit with that uncomfortable thing so it can reprocess and desensitize. With kids, they don't want to sit with icky things. If I was like, I want you to sit with this icky feeling, they're going to be like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. The preparation for kids I find is a lot more extensive so that they have the capacity and endurance to sit with the information. However, their events that they're processing typically haven't been sitting in their brain for like years and years and decades and years and years. Mm -hmm. Um, And their brains are just like naturally more malleable. So they, they're more elastic and moldable. Um, Are you touching their brains? It's like this. <laughs> um, it's true though. It's it's because they haven't have set these set beliefs yet, or they haven't been uh, this belief system that's been there for thirty years. It's been like a week or a few months, and it's like yeah, it's very easy to change yeah. the neuro neuro pathway highway super highway or whatever they call it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So with kids, the preparation's more extensive, but the processing is tends to be a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. With adults again, depending on the individual, the Mm -hmm. preparation takes less time than kids typically, but the processing, depending how long that's been sitting in the brain, it can take a lot longer, more sessions to kind of work it out. Uh, So you, you mentioned, you also talk, do some talk therapy with people about uh, like self-esteem issues and anxiety and stuff. Um, Would EMDR work on like old belief systems, like I'm a, I'm an idiot, I'm a loser, I'm not worthy, that kind of stuff. Or uh, like when people, yeah, yeah? okay. It's yeah. not just a traumatic event. It's just this belief system you can change with EMDR too. Well, essentially with the adaptive information processing theory, that belief, I'm going to clock it as a dandelion and be curious about what the root is. And so there's different, I guess, um, components of the protocol where we can explore that and find what it's rooted in. So again, I think it is such a effective therapy because we're not just working with cognitions alone, but we're working with the cognitions, the memory networks, the body, the nervous system. Poop. Poop. (laughs) We're tackling it at all (laughs) angles. Um, So yeah, when, when people come in with 
again, these issues like ang- like social anxiety. We're going to be curious about where that's rooted and can we do some shifting and reprocessing there? Is it like, is it like night and day? Like if you, if you talk to someone day one and then you talk to them after the eight or whatever sessions they need to get through it, is it like a different person when it comes to that belief that they want to change or that trauma? We talk about this lots in preparation. It's called like secondary gains. So maybe changes that you weren't intending to happen when you were like, I want to work on self-worthiness. Well, self-worthiness, if your self-worth is changing, you might, you know, start to have different boundaries in your relationships and you might start to maybe be more assertive or you might start to communicate your needs and wants more because you know what you deserve and you value yourself. Hmm. And so we talk about these things in preparation because with something like that, those are some of the changes that you may start to see as your view of yourself starts to shift is that you are going to relate to your environment differently when you have a new sense of self. Hmm. Uh, it's only happened a couple of times, but I'm starting to feel emotional for, for some reason. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I, I've, I've worked with, I would say most people who come to me want to work on something related to self-worth and um yeah the changes are pretty profound to witness it's pretty cool yeah i appreciate that you're doing this sort of podcast especially um one area that i'm really passionate about because i obviously work with a lot of parents working with kids is men's mental health because i find a lot of dads in particular can be very like when we're talking about like co-regulation and and emotions and that sort of thing. And like, how do you model this for your kid? They, they don't. And they're like, well, I don't have feelings and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you do, you do have feelings and like you deserve to feel them and express them and take care of them. And, and so I think not only like having a podcast like this to like talk about different mental health things, but also to, you know, be a male, like, being vulnerable about your own journey. Are with you assuming health. my gender? I did assume. <laughs> That's fair. That's good. Yeah. Um, That's okay. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. You identify as male. Um, uh, but I do don't call me late for dinner. Anyway. <laughs> I do think it's. I think it's so so important to have. You know what I'm doing? I'm avoiding but, the compliment because I, I don't. I can. Do well I know you're doing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> But you can think about it later <laughs> and maybe like just sit with like a teaspoon of it if you, okay. if it feels too overwhelming to sit with all of it. But long story short, I think what you're doing is very important. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Brianna. Uh, you, you're a really nice lady. I, I really enjoyed our conversation uh, and uh, I have a feeling we'll we'll talk again sometime uh, or something. Well, yeah, I'm sure we'll collaborate again sometime in the future. If you'd like to contact and make an appointment with Brianna, you can go to the website www.freetobeme.ca uh, free to be like the insect me .ca and uh, yeah, you can call that number and make contact with her and, and get yourself all fixed up there. Don't forget, next week I'm speaking with Elise Michaels, men's mental health coach. And if you have a business or a podcast or anything that needs any kind of admin work or extra help, I've got the person for you, Robin Joy. Uh, You can find her on Instagram, Robin Joy underscore virtual assistant. And she will take care of all your virtual assistant needs. She'll help you with launch strategies, OBM and VA services for busy entrepreneurs who want more free time. That's Robin Joy underscore virtual assistant on Instagram. Contact her right now. Well, that's all I got for you this week. I look forward to seeing you again next week. And until then, please remember to make your beds and take your meds. Bye. Bye.